everyone. Hello. You see, I told you you'd all be so busy networking and having fun. I hope you've had really rewarding workshops. We've, I, I've been involved in one uh, about communities. Fantastically exciting and interesting. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome Tracy Crouch, MP, uh, today to come and join us. Uh, she's Parliamentary Under Secretary for, uh, 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 sorry, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Sport and Civil Society, and I believe she's the world's first Minister for Loneliness. So that you know, you must be quite excited about that. But actually, what she's done is a great job since coming in is really opening the doors to lots of people to listen and learn to think about the government's loneliness strategy. So we're very glad to have you with you, uh, with us. And thank you, Tracy. Do join us. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for, uh, to the campaign to end loneliness for inviting me to speak today. I have to say I'm um, not a, um, a usual politician. I, I always get very nervous uh, speaking in public. And um, I have to say that the audience in front of me is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and when I think about the uh, incredible challenge that I also face in terms of tackling loneliness, you can understand if I'm a little bit wobbly on my knees. Um, I think it's um, uh, an incredible uh, challenge and I'm, I'm honoured uh, to, uh, to be here and to, uh, to speak at this fantastic conference. And I know many people have travelled a long way uh, to be here and the organisers are in, um, just incredibly um, thankful for that. Now, as you know, the Prime Minister asked me to lead the cross-government work on loneliness in January this year. And since then, I have met many, many inspiring people from organisations dedicated to creating connections. And the, that, that actually includes some of the speakers today and many of the organisations represented in this room. It's been wonderful to meet so many people who care so deeply about their communities and the issue of loneliness and who want to do something about it. However, I've been shocked and indeed humbled by some of the personal stories I've heard about the negative impact loneliness has on people's health and by learning just how widespread the loneliness problem is. And when I first started in this role, estimates of how many people were often or always lonely were between 5 and 18% of the UK population. Last week, the BBC released the results of its loneliness experiment research a third of people who completed the survey said that they were often or very often lonely. The research and campaigning led by many of the organisations here today has helped raise loneliness up the public agenda and helped many of us understand that we all need to take action. I was appointed to this role in response to the findings and recommendations of the Jo Cox Loneliness Commission. Now, jo was a brilliant woman and the honesty with which she discussed her personal struggle with loneliness was very brave. When Jo was at university, she would write to her sister Kim about missing the safety and comfort of family and friends. And later, when Jo had her children, she felt the loneliness of being a young mum at home alone. Now, I had my own very small experience of loneliness as a new parent, so I have some awareness of that particular situation. Uh, and we were just talking outside as well about the importance of remembering that loneliness as a new parent can affect dads as well. And sometimes it's harder to reach dads in terms of loneliness than, than it is of mums. But I've also heard the stories of many of my constituents who have been lonely when they've been bereaved or for whatever reason lost touch with family members and friends. Now these are all too common experiences for so many people in this country. We may not know it, but all of us will know someone who feels alone in our rapidly changing world. There is a common misconception that this is only an issue which is particularly common in later life. But as Joe said, loneliness can affect anyone at any time. And that is why the government's work is looking at loneliness across all age groups. The key point for me is not to pick one group over another, but to recognise we can all experience loneliness, whatever our age. This government recognises that loneliness is one of the most important public health challenges that we face on a par with smoking or obesity. But it's also linked to an increased risk of coronary heart disease, depression, cognitive de decline and Alzheimer's disease. It's bad for our communities too. Because if we're not spending time with each other, then we are not understanding one another. And Joe's message was that we all have the power to know our neighbours and by doing so, improve our communities. Now, it's an honour for me to be asked to lead the cross-government work on loneliness, but it's also quite overwhelming at times. And there are people in this room that 
uh, have been in meetings with me knowing that uh, you know, I feel I need to go and breathe heavily into a paper bag after the meetings just because of the sheer complexity uh, of the challenge. It is enormous, and that is why it's important to lead this as a cross-government programme, linking up solutions across departments and sectors. However, loneliness is not an issue that government can tackle alone. It is a problem that all of us in society must tackle together. So the government work is designed to complement and support the good work already being led by communities, charities, businesses, health professionals and individuals. The Be More Us campaign from the Campaign to End Loneliness does a great job of inspiring people to reach out and make a difference to those they come across in their everyday lives. After all, government can't make our friends for us. But government does have a role in creating the conditions to enable individuals, communities, local authorities, business, businesses and the health and the voluntary sectors to support people's social well-being and relationships. Now, we will shortly be publishing the first government strategy for tackling loneliness in England. And we're grateful the expertise and advice that so many people and organisations in this room have contributed to that work. The strategy will set out government action in three key areas. First, where government policies and activities can directly support people to avoid loneliness and to build social connections. Nine government departments have worked together on this. From the Department for Transport, looking at how transport can best bring people together, to the Department for Education, exploring how to build character and resilience among young people. And the cross-government strategy is supported by £20.5 million of extra grant funding announced earlier this year. This includes the £11.5 million Building Connections Fund, which is a partnership between Government, Big Lottery Fund and the Co-op Foundation. In addition to this new fund, People's Postcode Lottery has committed £5 million of, health, of players' money to top up existing grants it has given to charities that combat loneliness. And the Health Lottery is giving out £4 million to charities that work to improve social links in disadvantaged areas across England. And we're working as well with other organisations like the Red Cross. The fund will support local initiatives that have a direct impact on people's lives and we're really excited about all the great activities and groups that will be supported by the fund. A second, the strategy covers how government can work with partners to improve the evidence on what works in tackling loneliness so we can all focus our efforts where they will have the most impact. The Office for National Statistics has been working with academics, frontline practitioners and other experts to come up with one consistent way to measure loneliness that we can all use. This should make it much easier to compare and read across different surveys and research so we all understand better the overall picture on loneliness. And we're also working uh, with the What Work Centre for Wellbeing to carry out a rapid review of interventions that tackle loneliness so that we all better understand what approaches are most effective. And third, the strategy considers how government can contribute to the national conversation. We need to talk more about the issue to raise awareness and reduce stigma. We are with loneliness now where we were with mental health a decade ago. Our partners at the Campaign to End Loneliness, the Loneliness Action Group and the Joe Cox Foundation are doing some incredible work around raising awareness of loneliness and we hope that the government's work will amplify this further. We need to work with and learn from partners across society who have already begun to tackle loneliness. The government's vision is for this country to be a place where we have strong social relationships, where families and friends and communities support each other and institutions value the human element in their interactions with people, where loneliness can be recognised and acted on without stigma or shame, where we each make efforts to look out for each other and ensure that even brief moments of contact are respectful and meaningful. To get there requires society-wide change. It will take time. It's a multi-generational challenge. But looking around this room today and seeing how dedicated you all are, I feel confident that we will get there. I thank you for all you do from the bottom of my heart, and I look forward to working with you to make that change. Thank you. Um, I, the Minister's kindly got a, a few minutes for questions. I was just going to do a little cheeky one, if you don't mind, Tracy. Because <laughs> um, we had uh, Lord Laird 
here earlier talking about Action for Happiness. And I was just wondering, and I won't ask it too cheekily, but if you were um, the Minister for Happiness, uh, whether you'd have had a different job to do. And I suppose that's a bit tricky question. So what I really mean is, do you feel that there's um, as much that you can do about connections and communities and assets and supporting creation of all those assets as much as you can do in terms of tackling loneliness? Well, it's really interesting that you asked the first question because actually I'd love to be called the Minister for Happiness. <laughs> um, and actually, ultimately, and at the end of the day, that is what we are trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the UAE have a Minister for Happiness and Wellbeing, and when I met her, I did say to her, I much prefer your job title. <laughs> um, but we all know the British press and the, uh, um, the probably the, uh, yes. the response we would have got to that announcement. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of you know, sort of kind of connections and everything else. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we are trying to reduce loneliness and create a much better, much happier environment. You know, we have um, uh, research that's done across the world about the happiest nations, and we're not there. And, you know, it, we have to look at why is that, and perhaps loneliness and some of the challenges that th that brings and um, the, the connected uh, well-being factors that that also creates, you know, may well be the, the yeah. answer to that. Yeah. Thank you. OK, let me open up to questions from four. I think we'll take uh, three, if we get three. Um, and then, yes, one here, um, gentleman here, and then lady on the aisle. Thank you. We'll take two at the moment. Thank you very much, and thanks for sharing your time and speaking this, uh, this morning or afternoon. My name's Rob Smith from the University of Oxford, and um, I'm studying social isolation in relation to physical health outcomes. But I'm wondering, as a government, um, you want to tackle loneliness. Um, my question, this might be a simple or big question, wh wh why? Is the goal to improve population health? Are you gonna be measuring population health outcomes? Are you gonna be measuring um, uh, other outcomes? Like New Zealand is now measuring uh, social capital, fiscal capital, and human capital as a means of showing um, you know, the, uh, seeing, are we doing the right things as a government to promote the best society possible? What kind of outcomes are you looking at? And I mean, I think it's, it's a, that's a really good question. Um, and the first thing just to say is that we are looking at loneliness very differently to social isolation. So, um, you know, we, the, we have, we're using a specific definition around loneliness, which is about the subjective and unwelcome feeling rather than social isolation, which is very much an objective uh, sort of definition quite often caused by um, physical mobility issues or, you know, the, the kind of physical disconnection. So we are looking at it slightly differently, although that's not to say that we're not interested in social isolation as well, and that will come out, I think, in, in the strategy. Um, New Zealand are paying close attention to what we are doing, so I'm pleased to hear that they're, they're looking at the, the capital aspects. And the outcomes are very important. You know, as I mentioned in my speech, there are very significant health concerns. Uh, around um, loneliness, but we also know that it has an impact on health services. So um, I think Helen's here somewhere and she'll probably correct me, but I think one in five GP appointments is a uh, consequence of uh, loneliness rather than potentially a pure pe medical uh, 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 re reason. Um, uh, but there's also um, other issues around um, just community connections, um, being a better place to live. But also, um, from a business perspective, um, and this sounds more harsh than it's meant to be, but productivity. Um, you know, if you have a happier, healthier workforce, then arguably you're going to have a more productive outcome. So um, I think, you know, I, I'd like to think of it from, a, from a, a genuinely nice perspective is that we want to make people feel more happy. But actually, as a consequence of that, you will probably reduce some of the impacts on health services and um, uh, and you know, community disconnection. <coughs> Thank you. Lady up on the aisle, and then there'll be another one at the back. Hi, thanks very much. My name is Jenny Anderson. I'm a journalist at Quartz. I wanted to know what you saw as the main obstacles um, to promoting this. Uh, we heard this morning that maybe it's ourselves. You know, this is a bit of a lean-in movement. We need to be proactive. Um, obviously, you're in government, so obstacles there. And I guess very specifically to government, this is coming at the same time on the back of austerity, massive cuts to a lot of the things that really promote communities and elder care and Sure Start and a lot of these things. So how much of that is an obstacle to you? Thank you. 
Um, I, it's, that's a great question in terms of just even the appointment of a loneliness minister and the discussion that we've had for the last nine months, I think, has really raised awareness of the issue and, and I think actually made it a much a kind of broader issue. That, that was started um, very much by Jo and then from the Commission's work. I, I spoke about loneliness probably back in 2013-14 as a backbench MP but I did it very specifically on the issue around older people um, and I think what we're doing now is completely having a much broader much more in-depth conversation about loneliness and the fact that you have you know national broadcasters like the BBC you know conducting really good programs into uh, the, the, the issue around loneliness, I think, and, and all the phone-ins and everything else, and the broad spectrum of people having those conversations, I think, is an enormous part of, the, of where we need to go. Um, in terms of the other obstacles, yes, of course. You know, um, decisions taken at both central government level and, and local government le level, um, you know, may well impact on people's connectivity within their communities. There's no point pretending that, you know, none of that has has not happened, um, but we will be looking at, we will be looking forward um, in the strategy as to what we can do to potentially, you know, not stop that from happening, because local authorities have important decisions that they have to take um, on some of their services, but whether it can be done with a sort of a much more mindful approach to the impact that it may have uh, on loneliness within their, it, within their communities. And I have to say as well, from local authorities, I think they've become a lot more connected themselves with the issue. Um, certainly uh, in my own county, both uh, the, the, the two top tier um, uh, local authorities and both have started their own loneliness task force task forces um, and looking at sort of kind of better ways of working and the impact that it can have on the delivery of their essential public services. Great. There was a question up there and I think there was another lady over here. Hiya. Uh, Sandra Brown from Eden Project Communities. You mentioned the importance of getting to know your neighbours as a really key element um, in effecting the social change that we need to do to make loneliness, chronic loneliness, something which isn't such a prevalent issue. As the organisation behind The Big Lunch, which is all about getting to know your neighbours, I fully agree with that. And I just wonder, you also mentioned that we all have a part to play. What part is government going to play in creating the conditions where it's easier and more the norm for neighbours to get to know one another? Well, hopefully you'll see a lot more of that in the strategy. Um, so, um, but there are a lot of there are a lot of great organisations that are out there, like yourselves, doing that sort of kind of connections as well with their neighbours. And really interesting, I had a really interesting statistic, and I'm I'm sorry I can't remember from whom, and therefore I apologise if they're in the room. Um, but obviously we focus a lot um, when we think about our neighbours, particularly elderly neighbours in the winter or over Christmas. And we do lots of initiatives designed to get people to come out and, you know, go to their local community centre for Christmas Day and everything else. Somebody told me that actually people feel more lonely during the summer season because they can hear all their neighbours having bar fun barbecues. It never even occurred to me to invite, you know, Chatty Pat or Roy down the road <laughs> around for, a, you know, a barbecue. Let's all go round to Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be me cooking, so you're all safe. Um, but uh, um, it never even occurred to me. But so, you know, we put a great deal of time and effort into Christmas for obvious reasons. But actually, we don't necessarily do that for other times of the year. Okay. There's another question just here. Yes, um, Pascal McKeown, HNI. And I suppose my question relates to your role as a minister across the UK. Um, and I suppose I'm interested in particular either the work that you are doing or the work that you plan to do, particularly in Northern Ireland, because that's where I'm from and we're missing a government, um, but also across, across the UK around loneliness. Thank you. Uh, it's a devolved issue, so we're, the strategy will be England, um, but I know both Scotland and Wales are um, looking at their own um, loneliness strategies as well. Um, clearly, we, we think that the template that will set out in the strategy you know, can be applied not just across the UK, but across the world. And this is where I start to get incredibly sort of kind of nervous about the whole thing, is that I keep being told by visiting visitors visiting ministers from across the world that they're watching what we're doing um, and uh, um, you know this I, the, the engagement that we've had across the globe on this issue has been just phenomenal and um, you know I 
welcomed visitors from New Zealand, Japan, Canada, all sorts of countries, just because this, this is not unique to England. Um, and we all know that in the room, but I think this is the first time it's being talked about. Don't worry, we'll be passing on the strategy to the Northern Ireland office. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kevin Vaughan from Voluntary Norfolk. I was just going to ask a question about social care and around the you know, green paper and whether it's going to address issues around loneliness. And also, we've recently just had the publication of the National Carers Action Plan, which didn't look or address any issues concerning loneliness. And yet, actually, loneliness is a huge... Well, just to completely reassure you, the only other person that has loneliness within their job description in government um, is Caroline Dynage, the Minister for uh, Social Care. Um, and um, uh, the work at the Department of Health have been incredibly uh, helpful in terms of developing uh, the strategy. Um, carers are a key group, um, and we will be talking about carers within the strategy. We have use carers I think in a fairly broad sense so we definitely mean both young carers and and carers um, and um, you know I think that we are conscious of it but obviously Caroline is in charge of the social care green paper and I think she's acutely conscious of the crossover between the work that she has done on the loneliness strategy and indeed what she's doing as social care minister. Thank you we have a time for one more question this lady over here in the white jacket. Um, Dr Elizabeth Ormrod um, International Association of Human-Animal Interaction Organisations. I was interested to learn that New Zealand is looking to what we're doing about loneliness and I would urge our government to look at what New Zealand and other progressive governments are doing about pets and housing. Pets are the greatest creator of social capital in any community and they have very significant health benefits to mitigate against loneliness and depression and vastly improve cardiovascular health. So our country is now behind other countries like India and New Zealand and the USA, parts of Canada, where positive legislation has been introduced to let people keep their pets. And sadly, the people in Britain are most affected by negative pets policies, are the most vulnerable and lonely in society, the older people, the people living in social housing. We have to address this and we have to do it urgently. Um, I just want to, I could run off the stage and give you a hug right now, um, <laughs> <laughs> if that's with permission. Uh, yeah, I uh, am a, a mum of two furballs um, and, uh, and a non-furball, um, and um, the, uh, uh, I firmly believe that companion animals are incredibly important. Forgive me, I can't remember precisely whether or not there is a sentence in the, the strategy, um, I'm looking at my team, um, about uh, companion animals, but we did look at this. There are, you're quite right to point it out, there's actually no legislation, as far as I understand it, that prevents people from taking their animals uh, with them when they do move into uh, uh, accommodation. Um, but you're right, there, there are policies out there. Now, that's not my portfolio, but I completely and utterly um, agree with you in terms of the importance and power of uh, companion animals in terms of keeping people connected. And we know, for example, that uh, while I'm a cat owner, um, we do know that dog owners, for example, lead much healthier uh, lives, both physically and from a mental well-being perspective, not least because of the people that they meet when they're out on their walk. So I've never met a dog walker that is out there not talking to anybody. So, um, so I completely um, understand uh, and appreciate where you're coming from. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. We, we're all going round Tracy's for a barbecue, um, and then we get to cuddle the Minister and her cats, which is great. Um, I just want to say uh, one thing. Uh, when I started in this area about 10 years ago, there's a fantastic documentary by Sue Bourne uh, called My Street, and it was just about how you realise that you don't really know the people two doors down or three doors down, and actually that realisation. And I think we should be really realistic about the loneliness strategy. Government 
can provide frameworks and it can provide support to understand what works. But even though we've been through austerity for the last few years, there's a thriving community and there's thriving projects and programs that are trying to do really great work. So we still have our own personal responsibility as individuals, as family members, as neighbours and streets and communities, as well as expecting and hoping that government can provide some kind of framework for the future. And let's hope that we can have a continuing relationship with the minister who's not just lonely, but who's helping happiness. So thank you very much. Thank you.